or looking forward to being at your church and sharing. Looking forward to coming in a couple of weeks for our, the uh, Family Life Relationship Conference we're going to be teaching here. I am excited about that. I believe that God is a relational God. He operates that way. He thinks that way. And he wants us to think that way as well. So I want to encourage you to plan on that and be a part of that. Uh, we do have some material on the back. Uh, Brother Morris mentioned earlier, this is a flyer that tells about our ministry. What we do, we're in a helps ministry that helps churches uh, deal with difficulties and challenges that they face. Uh, I have a prayer card there. It's also it's back on the table there where I got that nice little basket of all the daily bread. So you guys go back there and, and pick up one afterwards. Pick up several prayer cards. Missionaries want you to have prayer cards. And you can think of multiple places to put it. You can put one on your refrigerator. Now, that's the classic, okay? Everybody sticks prayer cards on refrigerators. But I have a few other suggestions. One of them would be maybe you could take it and super glue it to your ceiling in your bedroom, right? That way, when you go to bed at night, you will be looking down upon you. That sounds a little creepy. Uh, but we'll be looking down upon you, and you can pray for us. I'll give you the number one place to put a prayer card, though you'll tape it to your TV set. Then I know you'll pray for us. Or want us to get out of the way or something. But anyway. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 14. Uh, we're going to, we looked at a story earlier of Jesus, a, a story that he told. And now we're going we're to look at a story that actually was an event that unfolded in Jesus' life and in the disciples' life. A uh, very powerful story, and it's written by God, brought, brought into our scripture because God has a divine purpose for it, and there's a lot that we can learn from it. Now, this is going to be a very familiar story. You've heard it over and over again, and you've probably been taught it. You've probably taught it if you're a Sunday school teacher, and it has just a fun story to tell for a lot of different reasons. It's basically recorded in the gospel accounts. Uh, Matthew has a more extensive little bit of comments on it that's not in some of the other books. But it is a, it is a very powerful story. And um, I've titled the message this morning, To Walk on Water. Now, I did some serious thinking about what kind of a title to give this message. I thought I could title this to go where no man has gone before, you know. Or I could title it to dream the impossible dream, but somebody would probably write a song about that. Um, I could title it To Dare to Be a Daniel, but this is about Peter, so that's not going to work. Uh, or I could title it uh, William Carey's Great Statement, To Attempt Great Things for God. But I've decided just to call it To Walk on Water because that in itself is pretty impressive. Now, one of the great questions that we all have, and if we're really honest and really want to face ourselves and face God, this is probably a question that every single believer has asked themselves in one way or another. And the question is this, can God really use me? You see, I can believe that God can use you because maybe you're living your Christian life before me in a way that's God-honoring and good. But the problem with me is I know about me. I know all the weaknesses that are in me. I know all the failures that are in me. I know all the selfishness that's in me. And so when I, I think about this question, can God really use me? Um, that's probably not the best question because the fact is he's God and can do it. So there probably isn't any question that he could use people even when they don't want to be. Some of us are used willingly and some of us go kicking and screaming down the, the way. But God can do it. The real question, the real issue then, is not whether or not God can use me, but am I willing to run the risk and take the chance on God that he can use me? Am I willing to step out and risk him, that he'll keep his word, that he'll do what he says, and that he'll stand by me as he's promised? That becomes the real question. Peter probably could have asked that question too. Can God use me? Peter had quite the reputation, as you read through Scripture. He's a, he's a character. And um, what I love about the Bible is it really tells about the people that are there. You know, somebody says, boy, wouldn't it be cool to be in the Bible? I don't think so. You get to know about me. It's in the Bible. The Bible's very honest, very open, you know, and, and it's a description of people. And, and Peter had a reputation. Peter was bold. It was Peter that cut off the servant's ear. 
when they came to take Christ. Peter was careless. He made promises to Christ he couldn't keep. Peter was stubborn. Paul in Galatians wrote that he withstood Peter to the face. And Peter was weak. We all know the story. He denied Christ three times. But Peter was also perceptive. When Jesus asked the question of his disciples, who am I? It was Peter who said, well, you're the Christ, the Messiah. You see, God is working in each of us, developing our lives with a purpose of using us for what he wants to accomplish in this world. That's his heart. And God took all that Peter was and used it to accomplish his will with Peter in that incident out on the water that we're going to look at here in just a few minutes. Now the background to this is, is found in verses 15 through 21. It's the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus was there and he was, uh, he was doing miracles. He was healing the sick. He had multitudes came out, um, basically 5,000 men plus women and children. So we're looking at a crowd probably of anywhere up to maybe 15 to 18,000 people had come out by the Sea of Galilee to see Jesus, and he was healing people. He was having compassion on them. And that's a, that's a huge waiting list at a doctor's office. And there they were. And as the day progressed and went on, and it got late, the reality was that there were a lot of people there, and they were probably getting hungry, and they were looking around for something to eat. And it definitely caught the attention of the disciples. And they came to Jesus and said, look, we're in a really kind of tough situation where we got all these people and there's no McDonald's nearby or anything. And so what we, we need to do, we need to send them home so they can go get something to eat. And, and they, they, they believed they had it all figured out. This, they had the answer, send them home. And then Jesus came back and said to them something that just totally took them by surprise. He says, no, you go ahead and feed them. And you think about that. Now, we, we know the story, so we know what's coming, but they don't know what's coming here. He says, you go ahead and feed them. He says, oh. Uh, Lord, all we've got, this, this lad brought this lunch thing, five loaves, two fishes, and, and that's all we've got, and that's not enough. And Jesus bowed, prayed, blessed it, and sent them out with it. I don't know about you, but that must have been quite a moment when you took what, was, what you thought was just a very limited amount of food, and you're walking down there, and you bring this, this fish in this basket to the first group, and, they look, and you look down, and it's filled with fish. And as the story goes, these 12 disciples are out there and they're distributing this to all these people and everybody ate and there was so much food as a result of all that. I mean, I, that must have been something, pulling out one loaf and there was another loaf and put out another loaf and another loaf. And by the time it was all done, they had 12 baskets full. So it was definitely a miracle. There's no question about it. What's interesting then, this day had been a day of miracles. They'd watched. They watched the power of God. It had been a day of provision. Christ had met the need of everyone there, and so it was a day of satisfaction. Everyone got their fill. But there was something very unique about this particular miracle that sets the stage for what's going to happen next. You see, it was also a day of participation. Most of the miracles that Christ had done, the disciples were there watching. He would heal somebody, and they'd watch them be healed. They'd go along to be another person healed, or there'd be another thing that was done. Most of the time, they got to be observers in what God was doing. But on this particular miracle, he made them participants. And they had to be a part of it. They had to risk him. They had to take a chance. They had to take this basket of a fish and go out there and start looking at all these faces and start handing this out for it to happen. They got to be a part of it. They were participants in it. The disciples had been a privilege to take part of everything that had taken place. Interesting enough, it had been a day of lessons learned, lessons taught, and some lessons not learned. It's interesting enough that Christ had done something here very, very special. You see, we asked at the start of this, says, are we really, really willing to risk God that he can use us? Well, part of it, we will run the risk of serving God when we conclude that he can be trusted. Therefore, this conclusion had to come out of that day. Christ had shown himself the miraculous provider of the impossible. Get that again. He'd shown himself the miraculous provider of the impossible, 
Therefore, he could be trusted. And this was important because it it had been an impossible thing and he had met the need and they had watched it and so they ought to be aware of it. They ought to have learned that there was nothing that Christ couldn't do. He's worthy of trust. You see, during the feeding of the 5,000, Christ offered these disciples an opportunity, a chance to trust him. And just a little bit, a few hours later, out on the Sea of Galilee, he's going to demand their trust. He's preparing them. And so we come to the story that we want to talk about, verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship to go before him onto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Now get an understanding of what's going on here. This is the Sea of Galilee, and it's very, very unique. If you've ever had an opportunity to be there to see the Sea of Galilee, it sits in the lowest part of the valley. It isn't like a, uh, up on a hillside with a, a dugout area. No, this, this sea, the Sea of Galilee, this body of water sits in the lowest part of that valley. And what scientists say, that creates a unique situation for this valley because of the barometric pressure that comes down upon the Sea of Galilee. It actually comes down in the center of the water. Uh, a lot of lakes that you have and places that you see, the water flows across it or the waves flow across it with the wind and different things. But within the Sea of Galilee, because of the pressure, the waves come from the center out. And what that does is that creates the ability, as the the changing of the the moisture within the air and and the surrounding aspects of of the, the body of water, what it does is it creates the ability of sudden storms. The Sea of Galilee is notorious for sudden storms. Out of nowhere, they come up. Hence, very few people would sail directly across the Sea of Galilee. You wouldn't do that because you could be out there and caught in a storm and you'd die. So most of what was done is they would sail along the shore line all the way around. So if Jesus said, go sail to this other place and tells them a direction, they don't just go straight across it. What these fishermen had learned is you sail with the shore in sight. So that you come around and you just keep sailing around until you get to the place where Jesus said to do. And Jesus told them to go there and that he would meet them later. And so they do that. Now I want you to see something. I want you to think about something. This is very important. Jesus encourages the disciples to enter a ship and sail to the location he's told them about. Well, he sends them all the multitude two away. Now think about it. He sets up the circumstance that would demand his power of deliverance. He is deliberately setting this up. This isn't just something that happened. He is setting it up. And in verse 23 it says, And when he sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. And it really doesn't tell us here what he prayed about. And I, I was reading some of the commentaries that are on this. And there's a lot of different opinions. One is that Jesus was about to engage the forces of nature. And so from his human side, he was needing to be in prayer. And I realize that Jesus was 100% human. He was also 100% God. I don't think nature was a problem for him. I don't think I think it had a problem with nature at all. I am going to guess, and it's just that, but I think it's a pretty logical one, that he's up there praying for these disciples. He had been teaching them through the day to trust him. Now he was going to create a situation out on the Sea of Galilee where they would have to trust him. I think he was praying for them. You know, Mark 6.52 says that their hearts were hardened because they regarded not the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. They need prayer. And I believe that Jesus was doing that for them. And I mean, that's what Christ does. He even now, he's before the throne of God in heaven, the right hand of God interceding on behalf of believers. Now, back when he was here on earth, we called it prayer. Up in heaven, we call it intercession. But he was doing that. He does that today. When when Satan comes along and attacks you, Jesus defends you and says, listen, I've paid for that sin. It's taken care of in me. So Christ continues to pray. So he's up there praying, and these disciples are out on this boat, chugging along, rowing along, the Sea of Galilee. And we get to verse 24. And the, it says, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Now that changes everything. I don't know how many boats you've been on, how many ships you've been on. I haven't been on a whole lot. I, I mean, on our honeymoon, BB and I went to Key West. And uh, we took a boat out to the Bermuda Triangle, all right, glass bottom boat. And I tell my kids that explains them, okay. But 
I haven't been on a whole lot of boats, but I, I have been on some of the smaller crafts and stuff. And, and I remember uh, I had a deacon in Utah named Dan. And uh, Dan came up to me one and said, hey, what are you doing Friday and Saturday? And I had a whole list of things to do. And I started to explain. He says, forget it all. I want you to come fishing with me. He said, I want, you to, I want to take you up to a place called Fish Lake in Utah. Well, it, you know, it was very difficult, but he did somehow convince me that that's what I ought to do. And so uh, we went up there on Fish Lake, and, and he rented a little 10-foot boat. I mean, we're, not, we're talking about from here to the piano, not very big, with a little motor. And, and we get all our gear in there, and we, we go out there, and we go out on Fish Lake, and we're starting to fish. And it's, it's a lot of fun, beautiful day, all that's going on. Um, there's some things about Fish Lake I don't know. Supposedly it was formed with a, from a meteor hitting there, a crater. And it's very, very deep, and it has layers of uh, foliage and, and grassy type stuff all down through it. And if you drown in Fish Lake, they can never find the body um, because it's down and they're trapped and all that. I didn't know any of this, you know. And uh, we're, we're, we're just uh, enjoying ourselves, and all of a sudden Dan says, hey, get your, get your line in, we gotta get out of here. Uh, what? He says, yeah, we, we gotta get back to shore. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, he points up to some clouds that are forming there. I said, so what? He says, well, there, there's a storm coming here. And on Fish Lake, storms come up fast. And believe me, you don't want to be on a storm in Fish Lake. I thought, fine time to tell me. And he, no kidding, before we could get our gear all put away and get out of this storm had come, and we were suddenly in this horrendous storm, awful storm. Uh, I know you're not going to believe me, but there were waves five foot high coming at us. I, I, I mean it. There really was. And he was really good because he turned that boat right into those waves and we get splashed over. And I remember sitting on this little piece of cushion that was marked for life, safety, whatever, and holding on for dear life. And I had this thing in my mind, Baptist preacher dies on fish lake, you know, that kind of thing. Well, as this storm raging, I mean, we're exhausted, and he's trying to work towards shore, and the wind is just blowing, blows us all the way over to the cliff side where the rocks are, and you really can't get out there. It's an absolute mess, and, and the motor dies up there, and we're being banged against these rocks and everything else, and he says, you've got to roll us away from the rocks. I'll try to get the motor going, and so we got the rent, wind, and the rain is cold, and I'm rolling just as hard as I can, and he keeps being thrown against there. He's back there trying to start the motor, and I'm rolling as hard as I can. Finally, he says, John! Can't you roll? I said, well, can't you start a motor? Just so you know, I lived through that. These disciples were exhausted. They were worn out. In Mark 6.48, it says they were toiling and rowing. John 6, 19, it says they rolled 25 to 30 furlongs. That's about 50 football fields. These people are exhausted, and they're rowing, and it's wet, and it's cold, and it's wind, and, and they keep working, trying to get to shore. You can imagine the pressure that's building inside this little boat. You can see Peter and his attitude, we're going to make it, and Thomas saying, I doubt it, you know, that kind of thing. Now listen, this is so important. This storm comes upon the disciples in the ship in the midst of the Sea of Galilee. These disciples are in this predicament because of obedience. So often we think, why is this happening? What have I done to deserve this? These disciples are here in this boat, in this storm, because they did exactly what Christ told them to do. He had a purpose in it. And in verse 25 it says, And in the fourth watch of the night, that's between three and six in the morning. This thing's been going on for a while. They've been out in the storm for a while. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. In verse 26 here it says, And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit, and they cried out for fear. I want you to think about that. There is nothing in this passage that says Jesus looked any different. I know if you see paintings of it, he's got a nice halo over his head. But um, there was nothing in this passage that says he's different. He is the same Jesus they've interacted with and they've had communication with, but they don't recognize him. They cry out, it's a ghost. And you have to think about that. Why didn't, why didn't they recognize him? 
Why didn't they see who he was? I mean, Jesus quickly says, but straightway Jesus spake unto them in verse 27, saying, Be of good cheer, as I be not afraid. So immediately, uh, Jesus calms their fears. But why didn't they recognize him? Let me ask you something. If you were in that boat, in that storm, going through what was going on, what would you be praying about? I know what I'd be praying about. God, stop the storm. You can count on it. That's the first thing that comes to our mind when difficulty and, and uh, problems come in our life and we don't have solutions to it. What's our first prayer? God, stop this. How, stop it. Stop it. And if that didn't work, I'd be, I'd be praying, Lord, Lord, keep the boat afloat. And if it was getting on my nerves, I might be saying, Lord, can you please tell Peter to be quiet? I can guarantee, almost guarantee, that you wouldn't be praying this, Lord, please send Jesus walking out across the water to me. Why didn't they recognize him? Because Jesus was working in a way they didn't expect. God was doing what they didn't expect God to do. And I got to tell you, in my years of ministry, I don't, can't hardly think of a time that God did what I expected him to do. He worked in a way I didn't expect. And it was better. God's way of deliverance was walking straight toward them and they failed to recognize him because they didn't expect Jesus to do this. And in verse 28, it says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, if it's really you, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And Jesus said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. You know, we're, we're pretty quick to condemn Peter here, but look, he, he was very careful about this. He said, if it's really you, Lord, if this is really what you want me to do, if you're willing for me to do this, I'm willing to do it to it. And so you tell me. I've got to hear you say, come, before I'm going to get out there. And Jesus said, come. So he gets out there, and he begins to walk on that water. And, and we all know it's coming. We know he's going to blow it. We know that's coming. And that's usually the center of this whole discussion is the fact that Peter blew it. We must not forget that before he does, Peter walks on water. He does the thing that no one else except Christ has done. Peter does it. I don't know what it's like to walk on water. I mean, I've, I've ice fished, but that doesn't qualify. I mean, I don't know if you get soft and spongy or if you balance with the rock. I don't know. Peter knows he did it. He walked on water. And then we come to verse 30. And when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Somewhere between the boat and Jesus, it occurs to Peter, you know, people don't do this. This is crazy. What made me think I could do this? How foolish could I be? Somehow he took his eyes off of Christ and he put it on the storm and it was a serious storm and it was raging. And in that whole process, that action, he begins to sink. And I'm going to tell you what I'd be thinking about when I would be getting to sink. I'd be thinking about where's the water right now. It's up to my ankle, it's up to my, my thighs, it's up to my waist. It's going to be over my head in a minute. I'd be focused on it. I'd be, I'd be centered in it. It would drive me. I wouldn't even think about Jesus. Then I'd be thinking about, I'm going under. You know, we do that with, with the Lord. We do something we shouldn't, we sin. And then we get depressed about sinning. And then we get depressed about being depressed. And we cycle ourselves into despair. Peter's going under. He has no chance of making it. And he realizes that. He realizes it's done. he's done for. And he cries out, Lord, save me. Deliver me. You're my only chance. Lord. And I love Christ's response. It says in verse 31, it says, And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. Did you catch that? Immediately. Peter says, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus grabs his hand and keeps him from going under. Now that's amazing to me because this guy doubted him. I mean, if I had been Jesus, I'd let the guy go under. A little bit of gurgling, he'd learn to trust me, right? But not Jesus. Jesus grabs a hold of his hand and 
steadies him and brings him home. Now, God's always teaching. That's one of the miracles about God's grace to us. He's always a teaching. And he says to Peter, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt me? He wants Peter to understand the issues. But he immediately dealt with the need of Peter. You're getting to see the heart of Christ here. The heart of Christ is for sinners. The heart of Christ is for people who fail. The heart of Christ is to help those who don't know how to do it. You know, I think sometimes we as fundamental Bible-believing Christians, we get caught up so much in the religion of, of Christianity as opposed to really knowing God. And we come up with our own idea how God works. And we need to step back and look at, at the Bible and see the heart of Christ here, how he works. I mean, we have such a warped idea sometimes. Like, my, uh, my son's very hyperactive when he was little. I was hyperactive when I was little. In fact, my mom said when my son was born, I got everything I deserved, you know. But I want you to imagine me, Johnny, okay? I'm out in the front yard playing, and you look out the window, and there's little Johnny, and he's out in the street. <sighs> Johnny, get out of the street. You're going to get ran over. You're going to get hurt out there. Come on, and you put him back in the front. And you stay out of that street, and you go inside. And you look out the window, and Johnny's out in the street again. Johnny, you're going to get ran over. You need, to stay, you need to stay in the front yard. Don't go out there. That's wrong. And you go inside and you look. And Johnny's out in the street. Well, what are you going to do? Well, you get in your car, you back up, and you run him over so Johnny will learn, right? No, you don't. Why do we think God does? His children he deeply loves. He's going to teach now, believe me, if Johnny's doing those things, he deserves some instruction. And he may not like it. Hebrews 12 says we don't like the discipline that God brings in our life. The, what God does to us as believers is not punishment for sins. It's discipline so we will become like Christ. And we don't like it. And Johnny wouldn't like the discipline. He needed the discipline. But he's not going to get ran over by a car that I'm driving because I love him. And neither does God do that with we need to understand the heart of God to, to grasp. Verse 32. Now this is amazing. It says, And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Have you ever thought about how they got back to the, to the boat? I mean, did they beam over? You know? How did they get back to the boat? I think that Jesus took Peter's hand, doesn't really tell us, but I think Jesus took Peter's hand, steadied him, and together they walked back to the boat. And Peter f finished with Christ, what he wasn't capable of doing on his own. And they get to the boat, and something really fantastic happens. As they're climbing into the boat, the storm stops. It just stops. You know what that says? That the storm was never out of Christ's control that it lasted only as long as there was a purpose for it. And you need to realize that, folks. We all need to realize that. I need to realize that. That the storms that I'm facing, the difficulties, the challenges, the horrific things that seem to come into your life, and you say, where did that come from? Or what is the evil one doing today? And you look at all those crazy things that go on. You have to come to understand that the storm will only last as long as God has a purpose for it. When he's done, when he's accomplished what he's going to do, he, there won't be the storm. He's divine. He's in control. And in verse 33 it says, And then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. Isn't that something? They climb into that boat. Does everyone run over and say, Wow, Peter, that was a great job. I was rooting for you. No, he's kind of sitting over there like a rat, you know. But everybody runs up to Christ. Everybody says, Christ, and worships him. Why? Because they watched him rescue Peter. They watched Christ take Peter safely back. They saw him stop the storm. They saw the power of God in Christ and they worship him. I want you to think about something. Because this is amazing to me. Everything that God does, he does with a divine purpose. He tells us that in his word. 
which means whatever's going on in your life, he has purpose in it. And probably multiple purpose. God has a way of like a spider web of accomplishment, things going all different directions. And, and you see how it helps you, but while it's helping you, it's helping that. I mean, you can't figure it all out sometimes. There's just so many different ways that God works. And so there's multiple purposes. And some of those you'll, you'll get to understand, and probably some of those you will never understand, but God's still accomplishing things in it. But I can guarantee you that every storm you're facing has one definite purpose. It's seen here. And that is if, is when you pass through that storm, whatever it is, if you will focus on Christ and let him be in control, let him take your life and, and work through you through the horrificness of this storm that you're going through, others will see it and they will worship God because of it. They'll see Christ in your life in that storm. And that's in every storm. All the other things he's doing, marvelous things he's doing. But in every difficulty, if you will respond as God would have you respond, people will see it and they'll be drawn to Christ. Just like if they saw Peter turn to Christ in his failure and Christ rescuing him, the rest of the disciples saw that, didn't focus on Peter, but focused on Christ. And what a powerful thing that is. If you're going through difficulty, realize, if I decide today, but by God's grace, I'm going to trust him and live my life based upon who he is, despite everything that's going on around me, people will see it. And it will have an effect on their life if you choose to live that way. Now, in conclusion, I've got, I have a few observations here I want to note about this uh, passage. In verse 28, Peter chose to be in this situation. His desire to experience all the Lord had for him overrode caution. Look, for all we could say of Peter's failure here, he took a chance. He risked God that he was going to be a failure out there, and he was, but God took care of him. Peter wasn't going to miss out on the power of God just because he was afraid. And I really challenge you, don't, don't miss out. Be wise. Ask the Lord to guide you. Seek his will, not your glory. But don't be afraid to risk him. Verse 29. Jesus said, come. Even though he knew Peter would fail. Think about that. He said, come. Even though he knew Peter's going to fail. You see, God's fully aware of our weaknesses. I want to share something with you. You have never, ever taken God by surprise. Ever. There's never been a time you've done something that God said, whoa, I didn't know he was going to do that. That really complicates everything. That's never happened. Ever. The God who is with you in the week that's good is the God who is with you in the week that's bad. And he knew about the bad before it came. God is aware. Thirdly, the Lord brought Peter into a situation where the Lord was Peter's only hope. Verse 30. Peter saw Christ as his only way out. And that's pretty much where God has to put us many times. Often we won't let God work unless he becomes the only way out. And I've had to ask myself over and over again, wouldn't it be great, John, if you could just learn to trust God, not when he's your only hope, but realize he's your best hope. And start making that decision before you get to where he's your only hope. I'm asking God to help me in that. To become more what he wants to be, me to be. Fourthly, nothing is impossible with God. Verse 29. The question is not, can it be done? No, the question is, does God want me to do it? You see, so many times we can be arrogant and say, well, I, I got God on my side, so I'm just going to do whatever I want to do on out there. No, we, we need to pray. We need to seek God's face and things. But when God puts something before us, and you begin to see his hand in it, and it's scary, and you think, I don't know if I can do that, have courage. Risk him. God can do anything, including using you to do that which is not possible to do. But make sure... You seek his will. Now one final observation in this. The Bible doesn't record anyone criticizing Peter 
in this particular situation, but he certainly could have been open to it. I mean, after everything was said and done, they got back to the shore, sitting around the campfire, whatever it is, you know, and, and you know, maybe uh, Andrew leans over to Peter and says, you really blew it out there, buddy. Hmm. But the Bible doesn't record that. You see, criticism of Peter could only have come from those who were sitting safely in the boat. It's real easy to criticize others when they're trying to explore ways to serve God. Now, if you've been a Christian for a while, you probably have tried a lot of different things in serving God, and some of those things didn't work. And the wisdom that you have is, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to try to do something else. But sometimes that wisdom becomes a trap. You see this young Christian going out, he's going to try to do this, and you think, I, I know, I used to think like that too. Yeah, he's going to learn the hard way. What if we didn't do that? What if we said, how can I help? What do you... What, are you gonna, what do you believe the Lord's leading you to do? Let's look at a couple of things. Be supportive. Any number of things. But we don't have to sit there criticizing others. So let's don't. I tell you, pastors across this nation are in depression because they receive constant criticism. They're trying to figure out how to serve the Lord. They're trying to be wise about it. They're trying to look at how to reach into the community, how to help people, how to keep conflicts from happening. They're working through all those different things. And one of the things they have to work through at the center of their life is their own pride, that they're not arrogant. And you got all that going on. And they'd be easy to criticize. How are you going to help your pastor? How are you going to support him? Here it is, walking on water. That moment in time when God puts before us a challenge, are we willing to try it? Are we willing to do it? Are we willing to risk God? If you're here this morning and, and maybe God's doing that in your life right now. I mean, maybe you are experiencing some trials and some difficulties and God is beginning to shape your thinking and beginning to make clear that you need to respond to these situations. You need to stand for what's right, whatever it is, and you're afraid and, and yet there it is, God's word. Maybe... This morning, God's speaking your heart. It isn't miraculously coming forward that, that does anything, although coming forward is an acknowledgement that I really need people to pray for me. But in your own heart as you sit there, God, give me the courage to trust you. Give me the courage to do what you'd have me to do. You can make that decision right where you're at. You know the battles. You know the struggles that are around you. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you have a wonderful example of the heart of Christ here. Peter was lost and going under. He was going to drown. And Jesus, he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord immediately saved him. That's what the Bible says took place on the cross, that Christ paid for our sins, that he rose again, that he gives new life. He was a substitute in our place. And if we will come to him with our sin, not trying to hide it, but exposed before him who we are and what we are, he says he paid for that on the cross. And just as Peter cried out, Lord, save me, you're my only chance. The reality is, today, if you do not know Christ, your only chance to be with God is what Christ has done for you. And just as Peter said, Lord, save me, reach out to Christ today. Look to him to be the one to rescue you from going to hell and being with God in heaven. That's what the heart of Christ is. And you can make that decision where you're at. You can also come forward and have somebody talk with you share with you God's work. God's doing something in your life right now. Whatever it is, listen. Have the song leader come up. Dan, do you have something picked out or someone, you got something picked up? What was that? 366. Take your hand those and we're going to sing 366. If God's been speaking to your heart, the door's open. This is the purpose of this is, is to allow you, if you need, to come. And we'll have someone talk with you, pray with you, whatever you need. If you don't come, you can still talk to us. Service is over. I'm here. There are other men and women here that would want to do that as we sing together.